Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Monday edition of the Orange Brown Talk podcast. I'm Dan Lobby, joined by Mary Kay Cabot, as we do, as we always do early in the week, our Hey Mary Kay edition of the Orange and Brown Talk podcast. Mary Kay, as you can imagine, there are a lot of Browns fans who are, I guess, in a little bit of despair today, uh, watching the Bengals go back to the AFC Championship game, watching the Chiefs once again. I mean, they just we, we keep talking about these neutral site AFC Championship games. You might as well just hold it in Kansas City every year. That, that's pretty much where it is every year. Um, you know, we all saw kind of how the Ravens fought against Cincinnati. We got a few questions with this theme. So I think there's a lot of places we can go with this. Let's just start here. Uh, Dave, sorry, Dave, I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name. So just Dave in Vero Beach, Florida. Hey, Mary Kay, I'm depressed after watching the playoffs this weekend. These teams have stacked rosters. The Eagles have four double-digit sackers, plus a future Hall of Famer in Fletcher Cox, who has seven seven sacks, by the way. How do the Browns possibly add enough talent to really contend? You know what? That is a fantastic question. I will tell you what. When the Eagles came to town to practice against the Cleveland Browns this summer, you knew that that was a loaded roster and they were going to be really good. The only X factor really was Jalen Hurts. Nobody knew if he was going to be able to take this team where it wanted to go. But what a stacked and loaded roster. And you're right. In order for the Cleveland Browns to get where they need to be, they have to add some talent on that defensive line. And it's going to cost them some money or it's going to cost them some players Whatever the case may be, they need to get that defensive line uh, where Jim Schwartz wants it to be, where Andrew Berry wants it to be, where Kevin Stefanski wants it to be. Uh, I mean, if you just look at the history of Jim Schwartz's defenses, they were star-studded lines. And he is certainly as familiar with anybody uh, as anybody as with the Eagles defense, having been the coordinator of the Eagles defense for five seasons. So certainly they're going to have to come up with some guys somehow, some way uh, to run their defense the way that they want to. Now, is that going to be easy? Not by a long shot. Some of these guys that you look at that might become free agents when they're that good and they don't have any issues with their current team, you find a way to keep those guys. You do not let uh, good defensive ends and good pass-rushing defensive tackles walk out your door. So if the Browns are going to get a couple of those guys, they're going to have to pay and maybe even overpay for them. But at this point, I, I think it's necessary. I think it's what they're going to have to do. Look around in trades, look around in free agency, add that premier tackle, add that premier end. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm not sure how they're going to do it. They, I mean, they, they have some money, they'll free up some money. They'll find ways to, to get money. They don't have a ton of money though. There's going to be some big spenders out there this year in free agency that are going to be able to spend more than them. But I just, there were so many little things this weekend that I think probably should bug Browns fans. And it's like Philly, it just feels like Philly is such a smart team, which isn't surprising at all. Right. That's, the Howie Roseman, you know, of course, Andrew Barry spent a year there in part because that's sort of what Philly is known for. Um, but just everything they did, even in that blowout, you know, th- there were times when they would get a penalty on first down and they would use it to just milk more clock, you know, pretending to go for two to see if they could get a, an, you know, an extra half, an extra yard to actually go for two. Um, it's just little things like that. You can see that talent and then that winning on the margins, how good they are and how well coached they are. Um, and, and what a great job Nick Sirianni's done. Uh, Cincinnati, like to go into Buffalo in the snow and just absolutely dominate that game. I mean, just physically, mentally ever. I mean, that was all bangles from the start. It was just really impressive stuff. And, you know, I, I don't know. it. I can understand why Browns fans are, some of it is living in the moment. You start to feel better as you get farther away from it. But I can understand how Browns fans can watch some of these teams this weekend and think, man, how close is this team? Yeah, you know, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. I mean, let's start with, with Philadelphia. As you mentioned, smart, smart football. So it all goes hand in hand. The roster is amazing. The coaching staff is amazing. It looks to me like the culture is really, really good. And the play calling is good. The attention to detail. We always hear people say that. The attention to detail has to be so good. 
And, and that's what the Browns are going to have to get better at. And now from an offensive standpoint, I think Kevin Stefanski will have an opportunity to get better at that attention to detail because he's not going to have to worry about the defense. He is just really not going to have to worry very much about the defense. This past season, he had to worry plenty about the defense. That is one of the reasons that they ultimately, and I have some of this in a uh, insider column that I have up today. That's ultimately one of the reasons why they settled upon Jim Schwartz. He's called more than 400 games. He has spent 14 years as a coordinator alone. He spent another five years as a head coach where some of those years he probably called the defense. And, um, you know, they're just going to be so set and so solid on that side of the ball. Um, but the other thing to remember is that Andrew Barry has brought a little bit of that Philadelphia vibe to the Cleveland Browns. He talks about their GM, Howie Roseman, as being the best GM in the NFL. And, you know, that's a tall order. That's that's high, high praise. And, you know, he has said that for a couple of years now. And now it's starting to really pay off uh, for those Philadelphia Eagles. So the Browns have brought some of that, some of that Eagles sort of magic here uh, with Andrew, now with Jim Schwartz. And what I think they're going to need to do on the offensive side of the ball it really looks like Kevin Stefanski is going to be calling the plays again in, in 2023. And I actually think he should call the plays in 2023 because why give that up just when you finally get your elite quarterback? I mean, let's see what he can do. What if he turns out to be, uh, you know, a young sort of Andy Reid that just needs his Patrick Mahomes or something like that? I mean, you never really know. So I think that's the right decision. But Dan, when you talk about some of those little super smart things that you see happening on the football field, uh, you know, trying to get an extra yard to go for two and whatnot, I think that's where they need to do better in Cleveland. That's where Kevin Stefanski needs, needs to do better. And so they need to increase the game management, the clock management aspect of things. Calling plays is one thing. Managing the clock in the heat of the moment is another thing. And if they need to either upgrade or have better communication or whatever they need to do, they need to play smarter football. Smarter football in the heat of the moment. At the end of the first half, at the end of the game, in those little situations that mean so much to the outcome of a game. So however they're doing it now, I think they need to go back and reevaluate it and figure out uh, if they need to hire someone else to be the brilliant, you know, game management, clock management person or whatever the case may be. I mean, I know they have someone uh, upstairs that works on that now, but just that whole process, I think, uh, needs to get better, especially on the offensive side of the ball. And then on the defensive side of the ball, I think you're going to see adjustments happen this year that did not happen last year. They didn't happen. And that can't that cannot be anymore. So, you know, Jim Schwartz has all of that institutional knowledge about all of those games that he's called. And if an adjustment needs to be made, he's going to make it. Yeah. And I, I think the good news for Browns fans kind of in, in regards to that stuff is Kevin Stefanski is closer, you know, in mindset and action too. he's closer to Nick Sirianni than he is like Mike McCarthy. You know, mm -hmm. like you, you don't have to Kevin thinks analytically and he he thinks about this stuff and you know we see him uh, how he you know his fourth down decision making we do see some of his his clock management has for the most part been good it could improve and i think we saw that this year that there were times when it could have been better but um he's at least on the right path i wouldn't put him quite in the same class as nick sirianni but to be fair i don't think anybody would have would have said that even a year ago i, I think they probably would have said oh yeah these two guys are pretty similar so um it, this can change year to year but i think right now like on you know monday the day after the divisional round i, I would have sirianni probably in a class above stefanski but i think kevin is closer to that than he is to not being that yeah and he knows uh you know each year he knows he has to get better at things and he will go back and figure out and you know break it all down and pull it all apart and he will figure out what he has to get better at and I think he knows there are times when he was perhaps maybe a little too aggressive in a situation 
where something a little bit less aggressive uh, would have gotten the job done in a better way. Um, you know, there are times where perhaps maybe he needs to be more aggressive. There are times when uh, perhaps you need to run the ball in a certain situation a little bit more to close out the game. Whatever the case may be, uh, you know, he needs to up his game a little bit as well. And he knows that. I mean, he absolutely 100 percent knows that. But now he can focus on that. He can focus on that and he can focus on getting, uh, you know, in sync completely with Deshaun Watson. Now, having said that, uh, there are certain other things that I think have to happen, especially on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, we know what they need to do on the defensive side of the ball from a personnel standpoint. Got to get the defensive tackles. Got to figure out what you're doing at linebacker. Got to get this number two edge. Uh, But on the offensive side of the ball, some guys are going to need to step up their game. Now, when you saw George Kittle make that amazing catch yesterday, these are the kind of catches where, okay, David Njoku, you got to take your game up one more notch in uh, in this offseason and be able to make plays like that. I think he has the capability to do it. Uh, We have seen some pretty darn amazing plays, like the one with 32 seconds left, uh, you know, that led the Browns to be able to take that game into overtime. So um, 100%, some of those guys need to be able to make incredible plays. C.D. Lamb you know, made some incredible catches, right? But I think Amari Cooper can make those catches. I think he can make those C.D. Lamb. Wow. We know he can. We know he can because we've seen it. But now they need two more guys on this offense that can make plays like that. So I'm saying, David Njoku, got to step it up. Show us more consistency and some of those spectacular plays. Now, one thing, that, that he does ex- just extremely well, that George Kittle also does well, is block. I mean, did you see some of those blocking schemes that Kyle Shanahan had going on with George Kittle doing some, you know, amazing stuff? I mean, David Njoku can do that, and he's got that down pat. Now he's got to make the incredible acrobatic catch. We know Amari can do it. Now they need two more guys that can make those kind of catches. Okay, so along those lines, uh, let's go to this question from Tim in Huron, Ohio. Hey, Mary Kay, every year I think this team has what it takes and then they are out and I watch other teams in the playoffs and say the Browns aren't even close. I think they need two veteran starters. Uh, I think he he left out a word here. I think they need two veteran starters on defense and one veteran wide receiver with speed. So this kind of goes along with what you were just saying, what this team, you know, need needs to add to kind of get themselves up to speed in, in the arms race here in the AFC. That's exactly what I think they need. And I have been saying that. And actually, I don't even know if I could rank those three things at this point, because I think they are all number one, right? It's like one A, B, and C. They're all so important. Now, I don't necessarily know if the Browns feel that way. They might not feel that way. They might feel like with what they have, maybe they don't know need to go out and trade for an amazing wide receiver or find that wide receiver with speed that I think they really need to have. I don't know if they feel that way or not. Uh, but just from the outside looking in, absolutely, I think that's what you need. I mean, they thought they had speed uh, with Anthony Schwartz, but you don't know if you can count on Anthony Schwartz to be the guy that you need him to be. You just don't know about that. If that happens, that's going to be a bonus. And then again, move over to the defensive side of the ball. I don't think you can just hope that, um, you know, that Jordan Elliott is going to take that other huge step up this next season uh, in his second full season only as a starter, full-time starter, and be that guy that you absolutely need him to be. I think you have to go out and, and hope that you can get a Deron Payne or a Hargrave or somebody like that that's not necessarily going to hit the market. Um, again, If these guys are that good and they are, their teams are not going to want to let them go. So they'd have to be pretty financially strapped to hit the market, their teams. Um, But that's what they need. They need that caliber of of guy somehow, some way. And actually, you know, I've looked around at the, you know, at the potential defensive tackle market, and there are a number of guys. I mean, there are four or five guys that I think actually would fit the bill. So if some of those guys do make it, Uh, to the open market, you know, you should be able to get one of them. So we'll see how that, how that goes 
from a, a number two edge standpoint, once again, I don't think that you can count on Alex Wright just making that huge leap and becoming that guy for you. I think you need eight, nine sacks from at least from your number two guy. And in a perfect world, you would want what Jim Schwartz has had before. And that's three, maybe even four guys with, you know, big numbers in sacks. I mean, the Eagles had 70 sacks this year, 70. The Browns had less than half of that at 34, which I think was, gosh, I have it written down somewhere. It's way down. It, it was low. I looked it up last week. And also it's worth noting that even with, even with Jadavion Clowney's stats, their pass rush was like Miles Garrett. And like, there's no stat where there's another Browns player even close to Miles Garrett. He had almost half their sacks this year. And, and then even yeah. if you dig into pressures and you dig into other quarterback hits, um, whatever you want to look at, it was basically Miles Garrett and then nobody. Right. And, and that is why, you know, like, again, once again, not to beat a dead horse here, but, you know, I, some people have wondered, you know, why, you know, why was the Jadavian Clowney story that important? It was important because your number two edge needs to really produce for you. And he did not produce. Now, the year before he had nine sacks, although four of them came in the final two games. So, you know, for most of the season, he had five sacks. But you really want your number two edge to be producing. So they were tied for 27th in the NFL with only 34 sacks. Um, yeah, that's, that's not good. And again, that's less than half of what the Eagles had and certainly not what was expected from the Cleveland Browns. Not even close, right? Because you would have thought that you were going to get another seven perhaps out of Jadavian and that maybe you would get three or four out of Alex, right? He had none. Um, you know, you thought maybe you could get more out of Chase Winovich. I think they thought maybe they would get a few more out of Perry on Winfrey. Now, having said that, I'm sure that Jim Schwartz is going to look at the film and he's going to say, in my scheme, in my 4-3, we're going to get those guys some sacks. Alex Wright is not going to walk out of the 2023 season with no sacks. Not going to happen. Same thing with, um, you know, some of the other guys. So I'm sure they think that they can get way more production in his 4-3 wide nine scheme. And I'm sure they will. He plans to get more out of Miles Garrett than the 16 he's had in each of the last two seasons. But I still think that they need to go out and they need to find that good number two edge, like a Yannick Nagakawe, who in the past has really wanted to come and play here. Uh, you know, someone like that. He had nine and a half sacks for the Colts last year. You need that guy, not just for the production that he brings, but for the pressure that he will take off of Miles Garrett. And the way that that will help Miles Garrett be even more productive. You can't look out there all the time and have three guys hanging off of Miles Garrett. I mean, you just can't do it. So, um, so yeah, I think it's going to get better. But, you know, this is a huge issue. Okay, we're going to take a break. And then we've got some more questions kind of along these lines. Just so everyone knows, we're going to do, again, a two-parter of Hey Mary Kay this week. Uh, we won't hopefully have to wait until Friday to put up part two, uh, but we got a, a good amount of questions. We're going to do a two-parter. So if you're one of our tech subscribers and, and you're like, oh no, I forgot to get my question and there's still time. Uh, I'm going to, I'll check in again tomorrow and I've got some other questions to get to, but we're going to stay on this topic uh, when we come back after the break. DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, is officially live. Now you can legally bet on all your favorite sports anytime and anywhere right here in Ohio with DraftKings. For a limited time, new customers who sign up with promo code OBTALK and bet $5 or more will receive $200 in bonus bets instantly. DraftKings has the best features, including same-game parlays, player props, and more, with fast and easy payouts right at your fingertips. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers can use promo code OBTALK to get $200 in bonus bets instantly when you place a $5 bet on anything. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with the code OBTALK. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER, 21+, plus. physically present in Ohio. Valid one offer per first-time depositors who have not already redeemed $200 in free bets via pre-launch offer. Minimum $5 deposit and wager, $200 issued as bonus bets. Eligibility restrictions apply. See dkng.co slash oh for terms. 
and welcome back to the Orange and Brown Talk podcast, the Hey Mary Kay edition of the podcast. Uh, Mary Kay, let's continue here with uh, some of these questions about the playoffs. We're going to kind of make this a little more positive now. Um, This comes from Anthony in Columbus. Hey, Mary Kay, aside from the quarterback position, what evidence do you have for a significant improvement over this year? What gives you hope? Well, we talked a little bit about it uh, just in the previous segment, and that is the fact that I do think that Jim Schwartz should be able to bring out the best in some of these young guys. Uh, The defense needs a firmer hand, needs more discipline, needs new energy, uh, needs more experience at the defensive coordinator position, and quite frankly, some of the other uh, positions that, you know, could end up coming open on that defense. So, I think if they can get more out of Miles and other guys on defense, including guys in the back end, guys at linebacker, uh, then I think you should start to see the defense that everyone expected this season and it didn't come to fruition. I don't think you're going to have as many guys, you know, yelling at each other or, you know, shrugging their shoulders at each other or popping off about why didn't they do this or why didn't they do that and hinting around that adjustments needed to be made that were not made. Uh, so that is uh, the probably the number one thing. Um, and then on the offensive side of the ball, I do think they probably will make a few more upgrades. And I think that Deshaun Watson putting his head together with Kevin Stefanski and the other offensive coaches, I think they will be able to bring out uh, a little bit more in David Bell. I think that uh, I think they will bring out the best in David Njoku. Uh, so I think just the presence alone of, of Deshaun should help everybody else on the offense. Now, what he's going to have to do is make sure that he's getting rid of the ball a little bit quicker, but I think he'll play faster. You know, once the scheme is more suited to him, once he looks out there and he's got more guys that he feels super comfortable with or that are open, then, you know, I think he'll play faster. And then on the offensive line, those guys are going to have to, you know, they're going to have to watch a lot of tape and they're going to have to figure out how do you block for a guy like this? So the good, the good news for the Browns is that they were able to, at least to this point, retain Bill Callahan. Uh, So they will be able to build on the blocking schemes that they have. I think he will continue to bring out uh, and help develop Jed Wills, who needs to keep coming up that learning curve. Uh, you know, I think Jack Conklin will be that much better in his second season away from the torn patella surgery. I mean, he came back fast from that thing, and that's a major surgery. I think they have a question mark at center that they're going to have to figure out. Um, but for the most part, I think Deshaun should be able to elevate the play of everyone around him. I think Jim Schwartz will do the same on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, I mean, I mean surprise. It's It kind of comes down to your $230 million quarterback. <laughs> Right. Like right. you paid this guy that much money because you think he's that good. And if he plays better than he did in in the last six games, then that, that changes your outlook pretty dramatically because now you have a guy that you, you feel OK going into Kansas City or Cincinnati or Buffalo to, to give yourself a chance to win. You know, the other part of it, too, is, you know, we're doing these core player posts uh, that are going up on Cleveland.com over the next week or so. And I did the secondary today uh, on Monday. And, you know, I only I only listed Denzel Ward as like the core player. He's gotten the extension. He's, you know, you know, he's he's going to be here for a while. But the guys I put right below that, Greg Newsom, uh, Martin Emerson, Grant Delpit, I think you feel, you know, to varying degrees, I still think you feel good about those guys in the secondary. Um, and we'll see what they do with John Johnson, how he kind of fits in, in Jim Schwartz's scheme. But you know, if even two of those young guys can kind of build on, on sort of what they've shown us here in the early going, you have something going in the secondary there. You have something that that you can, you can build on in that, in that back end. Yeah. I think they're still in really good shape in the secondary. What's going to need to happen in 2023 is for roles to be more defined for guys to feel more comfortable in what they're playing and what they're doing. And Jim Schwartz has the flexibility to play plenty of man. He's got the flexibility to play plenty of zone. So whatever he chooses to do, uh, you know, they're going to be able to, to do it because he's, he's got that body of knowledge. And so some of it might be 
adapting that secondary philosophy to the talent that you have. And there's there are some decisions that will have to be made. Will Greg Newsom continue to be your your nickel corner or will you try to get him back on the outside a little bit more so that he can feel really good about what he's doing out there. I think that's one of the keys is I think that if if I were Jim Schwartz and I'm sure he will do this anyways, he doesn't need my advice, but uh, you know, I would really sit down with each one of these guys and hear what they have to say. I would hear them out because, you know, happy players will run through a wall for you. And there were a lot of unhappy players last season that just really weren't too sure what their role was, how they fit into the scheme of things. And I, I think that's that's got to change. You at least have to hear them out and help them understand and explain. If what they're going to be doing isn't exactly what they want to do, why does it make so much sense for them to be doing what you're going to have them doing, right? So if it doesn't turn out that Greg Newsom gets to be playing more on the outside and more man coverage or whatever the case may be, uh, you know, he has to understand why it's not going to go like that. Uh, and he has to feel good about it. He has to be part of the decision and take ownership. Um, but I think there's there's are plenty of things to be excited about in the secondary. I mean, AJ, AJ Green is really good too, right? I mean, Greedy Williams is going to be gone. As you mentioned, um, you know, we not, we're not sure what's going to happen with JJ3 quite yet. Uh, you know, I've been writing and we've been talking about the fact that he's a, he's got a $13.5 million cap hit for next season, and that's going to be looked at. I mean, that's just the way the business goes. That will be looked at, and they will do something about that. Uh, so don't know if he'll be back. Don't know if he will be gone, quite frankly. I do think that, you know, Grant Delpit is, you know, probably in the plans. I mean, that's a high draft pick. And he started to show those flashes of being really good last season. And that was really only his first full season as a real full-time starter, like full-time, full-time starter from the beginning. Um, Maybe you could consider it to be his second. But he should continue to come up the learning curve. But I think they've got uh, plenty of good stuff in that back end. It just needs to be sort of retooled and reshaped a little bit. Yeah, and then, and speaking of Delpit, um, if if you missed it, go back on our feed and listen to our our pod that we did right after um, right after Jim Schwartz was hired. Uh, Mary Kay and Ashley and me talked a lot about the hire, and then Lance Ryson talked, kind of broke down the X's and O's of it. And one of the things you'll hear a lot of is that Grant Delpit could really thrive in this scheme. Um, it, it could end up being a really good fit for him. And that, that strong finish to the year was really important. It kind of showed you like, okay, you, you can go into next year and, and still kind of see what this guy has um, moving forward. Okay, this question comes from Mark and Canal Fulton. Hey, Mary Kay, uh, Mark says the Browns have a long way to be competitive after watching the games this weekend. Is next year too optimistic for a meaningful playoff run? I mean, Mary Kay, I would say that like the expectation for next year should be a meaningful playoff run and, and like no less barring injuries. It has to be. I mean, it absolutely has to be. You don't go out and trade for Deshaun Watson and give up all of those assets and pay him $230 million if you don't plan on making the playoffs in the second year of his five-year contract. You've already wasted the first year. Some of that was out of your control when the suspension went from uh, six games up to 11, uh, but that was a wasted year. You did not make the playoffs in the first year of a $46 million a year average for your quarterback. So certainly the the expectation, the bar has to be set at the playoffs. I felt that it should be set at the playoffs this year. And the reason why they didn't get there this year uh, was because of the defense mostly and because of the special teams struggling early on in the season. Uh, so if the defense gets up to speed and can do what it needs to do next year, if the special teams are better next year, and if Deshaun Watson uh, is there for the whole season, there is no reason you shouldn't be contending for the playoffs. And when you look at the AFC North, I mean, who knows if even Lamar Jackson is going to be back? Jim Harbaugh says that you know, two hundred percent, he will be back for them, and everything is going to be fine. But um, you know, they will have a new offensive coordinator. In fact. 
Chad O'Shea, the Browns wide receivers coach, is interviewing for that job. Uh, so, you know, they won't have Greg Roman anymore. So, you know, they're going to be in a little bit of a state of flux on offense. Who knows if they will change their philosophy at all or whatever the case may be. Uh, but that could be an area where, you know, you can you can make some hay and and kind of get a jump on them a little bit. Uh, you know, the Bengals, I think, are going to be strong with Joe Burrow for a long time. And the Steelers, who we wanted to count out this year, can never be counted out can never be counted out. So uh, they'll have to see how Kenny Pickett comes along. But regardless of what's going on around you, you know, you've got to set the bar very, very high at the playoffs and they have to get off to a really, really strong start this year. They can't let happen what happened last year. So I was thinking about this last week and I'm curious, I think there's probably like three or four teams that I think should consider doing this. So Greg Roman let go as, as offensive coordinator in Baltimore And I feel like if there isn't another coordinator job out there for him, I I actually think Buffalo should consider this too. Would would it be wise for the Browns to give him a call and say, hey, you want to come in and consult for us and work with us a little bit on our quarterback run game and kind of see what, see if there's some things we can incorporate from what you did with Colin Kaepernick and Lamar Jackson and, you know, just bring another mind into the building, not to bring him in to be the play caller or be the OC or anything, but just just bring another mind into the building, a guy who, you know, has some interesting ideas in the quarterback run game. I mean, I'd do it if I were Buffalo too, you know, let's, let's bring, bring him in and see if we can get some concepts here that are a little different from what we normally run to, to kind of take advantage of this, this quarterback we have who can move around a little bit. Sure. Why not? Right. I mean, I think it's an excellent idea and uh, you know, he is, so accomplished and he's so good at his job. And as you mentioned, I mean, he is so well-versed in a, a dual threat quarterback like that. So sure. Why, why not think about doing something like that? Uh, as I mentioned before, the Browns do need a little extra something on the off- offensive side of the ball, whether it be, you know, game management or whatever the case may be. Uh, I also think that Kevin will continue his education of how to coach up a quarterback like Deshaun Watson. I think he'll do some things this off season that we may, may never hear about. And I think he probably did some things last season that we didn't hear about uh, in terms of getting himself to where he needs to be, to be able to call plays for a quarterback like this. So, um, you know, I say it all the time. He's a growth mindset coach and, and he will figure out what he needs to do uh, to be the best play caller, the best offensive mind that he can be for Deshaun Watson. But I mean, bring him on, bring on Greg Roman if he's out there and available. Yeah. I just, I love the idea. I'm fascinated by the idea, the idea of just adding, adding some guys into your building that maybe, you know, maybe what they do is a little bit different and, you know, we're not giving anybody coordinator jobs or even position coach jobs or anything, but like, you know, Andrew Barry's done it in the front office and Bob Quinn is, is in the front office and, We've seen other guys in there as well um, who kind of are just veterans who have been there and can sort of bring in different ideas and different perspectives. And I feel like this is a good opportunity for the Browns. Even You know, it doesn't have to be a guy like Greg Roman, but there's some really interesting things you can do with this quarterback and, and what he can do with his legs. And, you know, you don't want him running 40 times a game, but there, there's there's just some things I think you can maybe figure out if, if you just brought in the right people and, and picked their brains a little bit. Yeah. And the other thing is when you, when you look at the offensive staff, I mean, we don't know if Chad O'Shea is going to be, you know, going over to the Ravens and taking that job because from a scheme fit, if they were going to be continuing to run things the way they do now, it doesn't necessarily feel like a super great fit to me. Um, but there is a chance that they could lose Chad O'Shea. Uh, there is also a chance that depending on how the head coaching jobs shake out that drew Petzing. And again, I wrote in, you know, I wrote this in my insider that ran today as we're taping this, it's Monday, um, that he's someone that could get some interview interest from some teams, uh, possibly as an OC. So, um, so there could be an opening or two on the offensive staff. And, um, you know, in that case, why wouldn't you think of someone like Greg Roman? Now, he'll probably get a really great coordinator job, and right now that's not available here. But sometimes guys take a step back 
and take that senior offensive assistant type of job too. So, you know, there are options of trying things like that as well. All right, that'll do it for our Monday podcast, this uh, part one of the Hey Mary Kay podcast. We'll be back on Tuesday with part two of the podcast. We can get to your questions. Uh, I still have a bunch written down. And also, if you are one of our text subscribers, there's still time to get in questions. I'll be sure to check tomorrow, too. Uh, before we record, if you want to get involved, cleveland.com slash Browns, the blue banner at the top of the page to become a football insider subscriber. You get texting, a newsletter every day, and access to exclusive stories on cleveland.com slash Browns. And of course, subscribe to this podcast and Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, Mary Kay, I'll talk to you later. Sounds great. Sounds great.